Okay, now I, I really wanted uh, to read the prophecies which corresponded with each one of these kings as we were going along through these books. And, uh, and some of the times we did that just a little bit because the book either allowed it because it actually brought up, like the times it actually brought up Samuel or it actually brought up Elijah or Elisha or something like that. But we didn't do a lot of importing it from the actual major prophets. I wanted to do that. Um, but, you know, that would have required you guys to have too many balls in the air at one time. Uh, you know, this book and that book and as well as this prophet and trying to overlay it all together. And I think it probably would have lost you, though, if it would have been successful, it probably would have brought a lot of clarity. And I would have loved to have done that. And I kind of now kind of looking back on it, regret that decision. But at the same time, I just don't know that we could have done it. So tonight to make it clearer to you just how rich and detailed is the information we have regarding the events we have covered so far when you overlay on top of them the prophecies that those people and kings were hearing at the time uh, and, and thus the culpability that they had for the wrongdoing they were doing, it paints not only a clearer picture of what happened, but also offers us a deeper and richer understanding of the workings of God behind the scenes. You get a whole picture rather than just what's going on with the king and just how the people are responding. Because a lot of the times, without you knowing it, a prophet had spoken directly to the people of Judah or the people of Israel or to the specific king. And it doesn't show up in the book of Kings, doesn't show up in the book of Chronicles. So you don't know why it just looks like they were just evil and judgment came. And you're like, well, that didn't look like a whole lot of warning. But Truth of the matter is, there was a lot going on that wasn't mentioned. And so, uh, in order for you to get a better understanding of how that works, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. But, you know, to understand the workings of God behind, you have to understand this whole time that we've been reading all this, God is the one who's been working on each individual heart in all of Israel. He's the one going ahead of them and causing certain people to be born at the right time and raise them up into power and to maintain, to, in order to maintain justice and steer their hearts towards loyalty to him. He is the one who influences the hearts of Israel's kings and he's the one who influences the hearts of the priests and uh, influences the hearts of the prophets and influences the hearts of, of Israel and Judah and who speaks faithfully through the prophets to all the above so that they have not only the law, which you know many times they didn't even remember what the law said, because remember they would uncover it and there was dust on it and they would be humbled by the reading of it. But on top of that, there was the live voice of God through his prophets to these people. So all of this was orchestrated with God by God all at the same time. God's got all these balls in the air at once, you know? And he, so we understand when you can see it that way, just how orchestrated everything is. And it would be a mistake to assume that God only does that with Israel. God does that over all of his creation. Okay, so it gives us also a window into our day in which we are living. Amen. Something that we don't always really think about or we might think about, but we the math problem seems too big for us to, to wrap our head around. So we just we just chalk it up to, well, I'm sure God has something to say about this. We don't understand just how much God has to say about it and how involved he is in moving the pieces around the chessboard at the same time, largely maintaining man's free will. So it's really quite an astounding thing. You had something a minute ago, Terry, if you go ahead and say it now. Um, Jeff said I forgot to do what you asked me to do. And on the top of the chart, remember that Saul and David, they had the prophecy. Okay, yeah. Uh, at the very, on the very, very top, on the right-hand side where the prophets were mentioned, Samuel should be the first name because he was the one, as you guys remember, who was alive during the time of, of uh, David and, and, and Saul and, and all that. So you want to have his name at the top there. Do you want? Samuel. At the upper right-hand corner, the first prophet that's meant should be mentioned there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so getting that kind of information with an overlay of a pro of the, the prophets that, are, that were speaking to Israel and the kings at the time is kind of like uh, what happens sometimes in our nation, has happened in our, in our nation sometimes, when there are things going on behind the scenes politically, behind decisions that are being made, and we don't know... Sometimes those decisions seem off and you can't figure out why did they make that decision until many years later when that information is not classified anymore. It's not, um, it's not something that at the time they couldn't just let the general public know because it would have put things at risk. And so years later, we come to find out, oh, 
this threat was coming on from Russia and this was coming on from this and that was going on there and, and um, you know, there was this catastrophe in this part of the world and all that conspired together to make this the only decision the president could have even made if they wanted to. And at the time, we didn't know why they made that decision. Now, and, and that doesn't mean that every time it was actually a good decision. Sometimes they're just making dumb decisions. But you know what I'm saying. There's, there's things going behind the scenes that we don't know that influence the way nations move. And you don't know the whole story. And there's sometimes we've been privileged later on in history to know what was going on at that time period. And we're like, oh, wow, yeah, that now makes sense. Are you following what I'm saying? This is exactly what happens when you take the, uh, the prophets and overlay them on top of the time periods of the kings of, and stuff like that. You're like, whoa, okay, now that story makes a whole lot more sense. Brings it into perspective. So turn with me, if you will, to 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23. We're going to start in verse 31. We're not going to read very far before I start introducing Jeremiah, because that's what tonight is what we're doing. We're going to take these last few chapters in Kings and in Chronicles and overlay the ministry of Jeremiah so you get a bigger picture and see what it would have been like to understand more of what was going on, okay? So 2 Kings chapter 23, starting in verse 31, it says, Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was um, Hamutal. Hamutal, I'm sorry because it's kind of blurry, uh, uh, daughter of Jeremiah, she was from Libna. Now, that's all we're reading right now for that. You may or may not remember that the great prophet Jeremiah, who was the son of Hilkah, the priest, which we found about um, uh, several weeks back, and it's recorded in Jeremiah, the first chapter, had his ministry during this time period in Israel's history. King Josiah who we just had the privilege of studying last week, had married Ham-Utol, uh, Ham Jeremiah's daughter. One of, the, one of the things that helps clarify this is that rather extensive list that we read at the very beginning of First Chronicles of all the genealogies, so-and-so begot so-and-so, all the way dating back to Adam. I mean, it gave a complete list. And in that list, you can see who was married to who and who had whose sons and so on. And when you... Again, when you lay that on top of this, it becomes clear who the players were. Sometimes you might wonder, well, you know, there could be a hundred different Jeremiah's alive at one time. Which Jeremiah was it? That kind of helps when you go back to that list. So that gives you another reason why we have genealogies and why it was mentioned before you got into the meat of the book so that you would have it as a reference point to go back to and know, oh, that's who it was because it's set in order. And so you can tell and match up dates and so on. It makes things easier for you. Um, Jeremiah's ministry spans somewhere between approximately, and I'll give you this date later, um, 626 and 586 BC. Okay? About 626 to 586 BC. And those are approximate numbers. Um, his name is actually kind of difficult to tack down the meaning of, but it could mean one of two things. Either the Lord raises up, or it can mean the Lord loosens. Either of which fits his task to prophecies um, uh, in, in rising and falling of many nations. I mean, he was, that's what all of his prophecies were about, okay? So either, either meaning of the name would, would, would be um, appropriate. Um, his message was pivotal both to their time and to ours, kind of like I said a few minutes ago. Uh, many Christians just can't seem to wrap their head around the notion that God would bring his people into judgment or that he would literally raise up and appoint a pagan king as his messenger to rule over them. They just don't have a bag to put that in. I didn't years ago, and yet this one is super abundantly clear that that is what God did with Nebuchadnezzar. He was called God's servant. Okay? Okay. So, and not particularly a nice guy, not at the beginning anyway, okay? So, and yet it's God, God owns the fact that he's the one that set the guy up. He appointed him and called him to this task of ruling over the judgment against Judah and carrying them away into exile in response to their sin. So this is a very, very big thing, and it helps us understand things in our modern day. Uh, God doesn't change. You know, I know that the covenant, our relationship with God has changed, but God himself, the covenant, as we've said many times, the covenant, whether old or new, never changed God. God remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he did things in the old covenant, he's still doing them under the new. 
Our relationship is different. We don't try to get righteousness by works. We have righteousness. Therefore, we produce works of righteousness because we're in union with God. We're not trying to obtain union with God. The covenant has changed, but God's not changed. Same God. In the book of Jeremiah, his prophecies to Judah warn and encourage them to submit to God's servant, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He prophesied the Lord's word under Josiah and on the, the, the debacle of this first king we're about to re read about, on through Zedekiah, the last guy, um, uh, his, his, his words of warning and encouragement continued throughout that whole time period. We are going to read a small snippet of what Israel and these last few kings knew and heard from Jeremiah before we read what they did. That way you get, you're getting that big picture I'm talking about. I hope that this approach will offer you a greater perspective of what these was actually going on and why these kings were responsible and culpable for their wayward actions. Uh, they were acting in rebellion against things they had been warned by God about. So in Jeremiah chapter 25, I know I had you, we just read, read uh, just a little bit at the very beginning, we're going to spend our time, but now I'm going to read the prophecy that was written, spoken to these kings, is recorded in Jeremiah chapter 25. You can turn there or not, it's up to you. Starting in verse 1 through 14, it says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, again, you notice how God's setting up all the players, and he's also giving you a time reference point, doesn't he? This happened in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Well, his, natural history knows when that happened, and we've got that tacked down as a date. So you already now can work either direction and tack down the time period for Israel, right? Um, verse 2, the prophet Jeremiah spoke concerning all the things, all the people of Judah and all the residents of Jerusalem as follows. He said, from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you time and time again. Remember those words, because we're going to read those exact same words later on. But notice that since before this bad king came and before the beginning of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar who carried these people away into exile, he had been warning them time and time again, all right? He says, but you have not obeyed. The Lord sent all of his servants, the prophets, to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed or even paid attention. He announced, Turn, each one of you, from your evil way of life and from your evil deeds. Live in the land the Lord uh, gave you and your ancestors forever and ever. Do not follow after gods to serve them and to worship them, and do not provoke me to anger by the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. But you would not obey me. This is the Lord's declaration. In order that you might provoke me to anger by the work of your hands and bring disaster on yourselves. Therefore, this is what the Lord of hosts says. Because you have not obeyed my words, I am going to send forth all the families of the north. This is the Lord's declaration. And send for my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and I will bring them against this land, against its residents, and against all of these surrounding nations. And I will completely destroy them and make them a desolation, a derision, and ruins forever. I will eliminate the sound of joy and gladness from them, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride, the sound of the millstone and the light of the lamp. The whole land will become des a desolate ruin, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. When the 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that great na and that nations. Yeah, and that nation, this is the Lord's declaration. The land of the Chaldeans for their guilt, and I will make that make it a ruin forever. I will bring on it, uh, bring on that land all my words I've spoken against it. All that is written in this book that Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations, for many nations and great kings will enslave them, and I will pay them, repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. Now this is, again, this is, that's a pretty clear declaration, isn't it? Now, if we were to keep reading this chapter, which we're not going to right now, um, the, the king of Pharaoh, Pharaoh was mentioned, king of Egypt, uh, Persia, Elam, 
is mentioned, uh, Babylon, Aram, Moab, Ammon, and more. All of which you will see mentioned in these accounts um, of First King and Chronicles of these last few kings. Now, we will continue on in the historical record afforded by uh, Kings and Chronicles and then circle back around to Jeremiah at, as we close. So we're picking up now, now back in verse 32 where we left off in 2 Kings. It says, He did what was evil in the Lord's sight just as his ancestors had done. Verse 33, uh, Pharaoh Necho imprisoned him at Riblah and in the land of Hamath to keep, to keep him from reigning in Jerusalem. And he imposed on the land a fine of 7,500 pounds of silver and 75 pounds of gold. Then Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, son of Josiah, king in his place of his father, Josiah, and changed Eliakim's name to Jeho Jehoiakim, but Necho took Jehoahaz and went to e Egypt, and he died there. Verse 35. So Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but, the Pharaoh, but at Pharaoh's command, he taxed the land to give the money. Uh, yeah, um, he taxed the land to give the money. He exacted the silver and the gold from the people of the land, each man according to his valuation, um, to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Jeho Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zabada, daughter of uh, Pediah, Pediah, I guess it is. She was from Ruma. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestors had done. Now we're going on to chapter 24 in 2 Kings, starting in verse 1. It says, During his reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked uh, attacked, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. The Lord sent Chaldean, Armenia, Moab, and the Amorite raiders against Jehoiakim. Remember I told you those names were going to show up, right? He, uh, he sent them against Judah to destroy it. According to the word of the Lord, he had spoken through his servants, the prophets. Now, again, notice, I want you to notice when that shows up now. He had already spoken these things through his servants and prophets, not just Jeremiah, but others, all right? This happened to Israel only at the Lord's command to remove them from his sight. It was because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also because of all the innocent blood that he had shed. He had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forgive. The rest of the events of Jehoiakim's reign, along with all his accomplishments, are written about in the historical record of Judah's kings. Jehoiakim rested with his fathers, and his son Jehoiakim became king in his place. Now, the king of Egypt did not march out of his land again, for the king of Babylon took everything that belonged to the king of Egypt, and the brook, uh, from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. So you can see Babylon is beginning to spread over the land and his, the hand of the king is owning all of the restaurant, just like God had just prophesied. We just read that in Jeremiah, how he said he's going to bring into captivity not only Israel and Judah specifically, but also the surrounding nations. He's all bringing them underneath um, uh, Babylonian captivity. So now we're going to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, starting in verse 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, starting in verse 1, says, Then the common people took Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, and made him king in Jerusalem in place of, their father, of his father. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. The king of Egypt deposed him in Jerusalem and fined the land 7,500 pounds of silver and 75 pounds of gold. Then Necho, king of Egypt, made Jehoahaz's brother Eliakim king over Judah and Jerusalem and changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took his brother Jehoahaz and brought him to Egypt. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, his God. Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked him and bound him in bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. Also, Nebuchadnezzar took some of the utensils of the Lord's temple to Babylon and put them in his temple in Babylon. The rest of the deeds of Jehoiakim, the detestable things he did, and what was found against him are written about in the book of Israel's kings. His brother Jehoiakim became king in his place. Okay, we're going to continue on in verse 9 now. Um, these are kings Jehoiakim and 
Zedekiah, these last two kings. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king. He reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. In the spring, Nebuchadnezzar sent for him and brought him to Babylon, along with the valuable utensils of the Lord's temple. Then he made Jehoiakim's brother, Zedekiah, um, uh, uh, king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, his God, and he did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet at the Lord's command. He also rebelled against the king, uh, against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear allegiance by his God. He became obstinate and hardened his heart against the return, against returning to the Lord God of Israel. Now, I want you to notice here, what I, I really emphasized a minute ago, that he didn't humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah had been telling them, you need to submit to the king Nebuchadnezzar because God's the one that set him up there. And instead of listening to that, he rebelled. You see what I'm saying? So he, was, he knew what to do. He'd heard what to do, but he was rebelling. Verse 14, all the leaders of the priests and the people multiplied their unfaithful deeds um, imitating all the detestable practices of the, of the nations, and they defiled the Lord's temple that he had consecrated in Jerusalem. But the Lord God of their ancestors sent word against them by the hand of his messengers, sending them time and time again. See, I told you you're going to hear that again, right? Mm -hmm. Sending them time and time again, for he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept ridiculing God's messengers, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. Wow. I mean, God is extremely merciful, but you can only push so far, right? I want you to notice also how they're speaking about how the prophets are dealt with, how the prophets are, are ignored and not, not heeded and not given attention to. And can you hear words that Jesus said during his ministry that, that echo exactly what that said right there? He said, a prophet is not without honor except among his own people, right? His own township and among his own family members. Everywhere else, people honor him. But the own people that he's sent to, they won't listen. So he brought up, verse 17, so he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their choice young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary. He had no pity on the young man or and virgin or elderly and aged. He handed them all over to him. He took everything to Babylon, all the articles of God's temple, large and small, the, the treasures of the Lord's temple and all the treasuries of the king and his officials. Then the Chaldeans burned God's temple. They tore down Jerusalem's wall, burned down all of its palaces, and destroyed all the valuable utensils. Verse 20. Those who escaped from the sword, he deported to Babylon, and they became servants to him and his sons until the rise of the Persian kingdom. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, and the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the days of the desolation until 70 years were fulfilled. Now, I didn't take the time to look these up. Uh, I should have. I had very limited time to work with this particular part. But um, one of the things that God had told Israel way, way back at the beginning was when they came to the land, they were supposed to observe the Sabbath, not just the Sabbath day. Remember on Sunday, I brought up in the book of Colossians, second chapter, that there's not just one Sabbath, there are many Sabbaths, plural. And the Sabbaths, plural, that Paul was talking about to the Colossians had nothing to do with the Sabbath day. It had to do with the other Sabbaths, one of which was every seventh year they were supposed to give the land rest, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and they had not observed this. They just kept on tilling the land and planting, tilling the land and planting, tilling the land and planting, and just depleting it, depleting it, depleting it. And so God's like, you know what? I'm going to deport you out of the land because you not have not absorbed, observed my Sabbaths. And then for, for uh, I'm going to wind up causing all the land to be able to recover from all of the Sabbaths that you didn't give it during the 70 years you're in exile. Okay? That was part of the judgment. Okay? So, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. By the way, this is one of the reasons why it's important to watch where you're trying to get your food from. 
Because that's one thing we have done in America as well. We have drained and depleted the soil. Most, most of the soil in America has got virtually no nutrients in it at all. Because we farm the exact same land year after year after year. And the only way we can get things to grow is by putting man-made, man-generated chemicals in the land, on the dirt. And the plants can respond to the phosphorus and the nitrogen and, and potassium that we're putting on the land that's man-made. But it has, um, uh, just, like, just like drugs, when we make, make drugs, drugs are usually fashioned after things, herbs we find in nature then we will exploit the one thing in that herb that has this desired result. Then we'll, instead of extracting it often from an herb, what we'll wind up doing is synthetically produce it in a lab, which has a lot of byproducts, put it into a pill, give it to people, and then what you could have eaten as an herb that had no side effects now has a ton of them. Sometimes the side effects are worse than the thing you're trying to cure. That is the same thing that happens when you put the pesticides and put these man-made chemicals on food to grow. When you do that, it has a ton of byproducts that your body doesn't recognize as food. It recognizes it as poison because that's what it is, which is why there's been a whole group of people that have gone organic and they try to make them look like they're the hippies and the weirdos. But the truth is they're doing farming the way it has been done since the beginning of the world. It's only been the last hundred years we've been destroying our soil and pouring man-made chemicals on it. And then we have the nerve to act surprise why we're dying at 20 from cancer. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is one of the reasons why. We have to be careful what we put in our bodies. I'll just leave that there. Um, uh, but uh, that's one of the things that God was dealing with right here. Verse 22, it says, uh, In that year, Sirius, uh, king of Persia, the word of the Lord spoke through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The Lord put it into the mind of King Sirius of Persia. Notice this. God placed it in his mind. This is a pagan king. I don't think God doesn't deal with pagan kings and get his will done through pagan kings. He can't even get his will done through his people. Yes, he can. And he put it into the mind of his king what to do. Uh, to issue a proclamation throughout the entire kingdom uh, and also to put it in writing. This is what King Sirius of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, even this pagan king recognized who it was that put this in his mind. He said, Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem in Judah. Whoever among you of his people may go up and may the Lord, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, and may the Lord his God be with him. Now we're going to switch over to 2 Kings chapter 24, pick up where we were. 2 Kings chapter 24, we're picking up in verse 8. It says, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was um, Nehushta, uh, daughter of Elnathan. Uh, she was from Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and his um, as his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched up on Jerusalem or to Jerusalem, and the city came under siege. Then King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to the city while um, his servants were besieging it. Uh, uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, along with his mother, his servants, and his commanders, and his officers, surrendered to the king of Babylon. So the king of Babylon took them captive in the eighth year of his reign. Um, he also carried off from there all the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king's palace, and he cut into pieces all the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the Lord's sanctuary, just as God had predicted. And I'm going to show you in a minute where God predicted that. Um, then he deported all of Jeru Jerusalem and all the commanders and all the fighting men, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and metalsmiths, um, except for the poorest people of the land, nobody remained. Now, just be, uh, because we just covered this in 2 Kings chapter 20, a few weeks ago, when we were dealing with King Hezekiah, you probably remember this prediction given to King Hezekiah by Isaiah, the prophet. I'm going to read it to you. It's in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 12 through 18. That's why it says right here, God predicted this was going to happen. Okay? This is where God predicted it. It says in 2 Kings chapter 20, starting verse 12, it says, At that time, Mordecai Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters 
and a gift to Hezekiah since he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah gave them a hearing and showed them his whole treasury house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, and all the armory and everything that was found in his treasuries. Remember when he did that? And, you know, we're all looking at this and thinking, what a terrible idea. You don't want to invite a neighbor king in and show them all the goods because otherwise you're giving them reason to attack you, right? It says, then the prophet Isaiah came to King Hezekiah and asked him, what did these men say and where did they come from? Hezekiah replied, they came from a distant country, from Babylon. Isaiah asked, what have they seen in your palace? Hezekiah answered, well, they've seen everything in my palace. Uh, there isn't anything in my treasuries that I didn't show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will certainly come when everything in your palace and all of your father and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be de left, said the Lord. Some of your descendants who will come from you will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. This is all stuff God had said two kings ago, three kings ago, right? That it was going to happen. And sure enough, now here it's, gone, it's happened. Verse 15, back where we were, and I um, uh, don't remember now where we are. Um, 2 Kings 24. 2 Kings 24, that's right, thank you. I had to scroll up. I got a long way to scroll up with this little tiny device. Verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar deported Jehoiakim to Babylon. He also took the king's... Or did I? I already read that, didn't I? No, no, okay. Also took the king's mother, the king's wives, um, his officials, and the leading men of the land into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The king of Babylon also brought up captive brought captive into Babylon all, all 7,000 fighting men and 1,000 craftsmen and uh, metalsmiths, all strong and fit for war. Then the king of Babylon made um, Medaniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. Now, this is the last king. Reigned in Jerusalem. His mother's name was um, Hamu, Hamutal, daughter of Jeremiah, she was from Libna. Zedekiah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as Jehoiakim had done. Because the Lord's anger, uh, because of the Lord's anger, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judah that he finally banished them from his presence, meaning God banished them. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Bad idea. Now, if we normally had read this, we would have not have thought, well, why is that a bad idea? He's a, he's a neighboring king that's a pagan king. Of course, you're going to fight against him. But we know the other side of the coin. Jeremiah's been warning them, God is delivering you into their hands. So now, by, re, by uh, fighting against Babylon, he's also fighting against the command of God. You see? Second, now we're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 25. 2 Kings chapter 25, we're starting in verse 1. It says, In the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day... Of the tenth month, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon advanced against Jerusalem with his entire family. They laid siege to the city and built um, a, a siege wall against it all around. The city was under siege until King Zedekiah, Zedekiah's eleventh year. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the land that the people of the land had no food. And so essentially he boxed them then. They had no way of getting anywhere or doing anything. Then the city was broken into, and all the warriors fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls, where the king's garden and uh, um, near the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans surrounded the city. As the king made his way along the route to uh, to the Areba, the um, the Chaldean army pursued him and overtook him um, in the plains of Jericho. Zedekiah's entire army was scattered from him. The Chaldeans seized the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. They, uh, they slaughtered Zedekiah's sons before his eyes. Finally, the king of Babylon blinded Zedekiah, bound him in bronze chains, and took him to Babylon. So essentially he made the last thing that Zedekiah ever saw was the slaughter of his own children. Um, just, you know, pretty sick people. On the seventh day of the fifth month, was the 19th, uh, um, which was the 19th year of King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, uh, Neb Nebuzadar Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guards, 
a servant of the king of Babylon, entered Jerusalem. He burned the Lord's temple, the king's palace, and all of the houses of Jerusalem. He burned down all the great houses. The, the whole Chaldean army with, all, with the commanders of the guards tore down the walls surrounding Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guards, deported the rest of the people who were left in the city, the deserters who had defected to the king of Babylon, and the rest of the population. But the commander of the guards left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and farmers. Now the Chaldeans broke into pieces the bronze pillars of the Lord's temple, um, the water carts and the bronze reservoir, which were in the Lord's temple, and they carried the bronze to Babylon. They also took the pots, the, the shovels, the wick trimmers, the dishes, and all the bronze articles used in the temple service. The commander of the guards took away the fire pans and the sprinkling basins, whatever was gold or silver. As for the two pillars, the one uh, re the one reservoir and the water carts that Solomon had made for the Lord's temple, which, by the way, that was written in, in 1 Kings chapter 7, we read a little long time ago. And the same measurements are mentioned here that were mentioned in 1 Kings. It says, As for the two pillars and the one reservoir and the water carts that Solomon had made for the Lord's temple, the weight of the bronze of all of the articles was beyond measure. One pillar was 27 feet tall and had a bronze cap, uh, um, capital on top of it. The, the capital um, encircled by a grating and pomegranates of bronze uh, stood five foot high. The uh, second pillar was the same with its own grating. The commander of the guards also took away uh, Sirai, Sir uh, the chief priest, uh, Zephaniah, the priest of the second rank, and the three doorkeepers. From the, city, uh, from the city, he took a court official who had been appointed over the warriors, five trusted royal aides found in the city, the, sec the secretary of the commander of the army who enlisted the people of the, land, of the land for military duty, and 60 men from the common people who were found in the city. Uh, Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guards, took, uh, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Ribla. The king ba of Babylon put them to death at Ribla in the land of Hamath, so Judah went into exile from its land. Now we're going to read, uh, starting in verse 22, about Jeremiah's friend winds up governing Judah. Okay? Verse 22. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, appointed Gedaliah, son of Hilcom, son of uh, Shaphan, over the rest of the people he left in the land of Judah. When all the commanders of the, army, uh, of the armies, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, uh, they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah. The commanders included Ishmael, son of Nathania, uh, Johanna, son of Kira, Sariah, son of Tenhumeth, the Netufalathite, and Jaznahai, son of Makathite. No, 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 there's no N. Uh, Makathite. Makathite. Um, they and other men. Gadala swore an oath to them and their men, assuring them, "Don't be afraid. The servants of uh, uh, don't be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon. It will go well for you." Now, I'm going to read to you something from Jameson Fawcett and Brown, a commentator I often reference, um, that talks about how this guy Gadala was actually a friend of Jeremiah, and this is why he didn't wind up resisting Babylon the king, okay, because all the other kings, even though they knew what to do, even though they knew the decree of the prophet Jeremiah, they still wound up rebelling and it cost them. This guy submitted to the authority of the king, okay. Um, Gedaliah was Jeremiah's friend, which is found in Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 24. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 24. And having, by the prophet's counsel, probably fled from the city as abandoned um, uh, as abandoned of God, he surrendered himself to the conqueror. And being promoted to govern uh, to the government of Judah, fixed his pro uh, um, his provincial court at Mizpah. He was well qualified to surmount the difficulties of ruling at such a crisis. Many of the fugitive Jews, as well as the soldiers of Zedekiah, who had accompanied the king in his flight. Uh, to the plains of Jericho, left their retreats and flocked around this governor. And having counseled them to submit, 
promised them on complying with this condition, security, uh, security on oath, that they would retain their possessions and enjoy the produce of their land. And that's also found in Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 9. Now, going back over there to where we were, so chapter, we're picking up in verse 25. In the seventh month, however, Ishmael, son of Nathaniah, son of Eliashama, of the royal family, came with ten man, men and struck down um, Gedaliah, and he died. Also, they killed the Jews, the Chaldeans, who were with them at Mizpah. Then all the people, from the youngest to the oldest, and the commanders of their armies, were uh, um, left and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Now, the reason why this happened, by the way, was because this particular group of Chaldeans, a lot of the Chaldeans were now submitted to and working with um, the king of Babylon. But there was a group of Chaldeans that had mounted a resistance movement against the uh, king Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And so they viewed Gilda, um, uh, um, Gedaliah's um, compliance with king Nebuchadnezzar as though he was a collaborator and a traitor. And so they hated him and so they killed him. So picking back up in verse 27. On the, 20, on the 27th day of the 12th month of the 37th year of the exile of Judah's king uh, Jehoiakim, evil Mordecai, king of Babylon, in the year he became king, pardoned king Jehoiakim uh, of Judah and released him from prison. He spoke kindly to him and set his throne over, all, over the thrones of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim... Uh, Jehoiakim uh, changed uh, his prison clothes and he dined regularly in the presence of the king of Babylon for the rest of his life. As for his allowance, a regular allowance was given to him by the king, a portion for each day of the rest of his life. Now, this last portion reads almost identical to an account given in Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 31 through 34. I'm not going to read it because it literally is almost word for word, but I just want you to see how they're in step with one another. Jeremiah's ministry continued in an environment of hostility against him. He was regularly harassed and threatened by Judah and their leaders, as well as by false prophets such as Hananiah. That's written about in Jeremiah chapters 26 through 28. Jeremiah had um, counseled and prophesied submission to Babylon, which again is why his friend encouraged it, even though he wound up being killed by the Chaldeans for it. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet for many reasons, not least of which was his charge by God to pronounce judgment on the people and nations for breaking covenant with God. In Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 20, it, uh, it gives you what was given to him to say. It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Listen to the words of this covenant and tell them to the men of Judah and the residents of Jerusalem. You must tell them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let a curse be on the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I command you, commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Uh, out of the iron furnace, I declared, Obey me and do everything that I command you, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. In order to establish the oath, I swore to your ancestors to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is today. I answered, Amen, Lord. The Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in all the city, cities of Judah and in the, the streets of Jerusalem. Obey the words of this covenant and carry them out. For I strongly warned your ancestors when I brought them out of the land of Egypt until today, warning them time and time again, Obey my voice. Yet they would not obey or pay attention. Each one followed the stubbornness of his own evil heart. So I brought on them all the curses of this covenant, because they had not done what I commanded them to do. The Lord said to me, a conspiracy has been delivered, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, discovered among the men of Judah and the residents of Jerusalem. They have returned to their sins, the sins of their ancestors, and refused to obey my words, and have followed other gods and worshipped them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah broke my covenant I made with their ancestors. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says. I'm about to bring on them a disaster that they cannot escape. They will cry out to me, but I will not hear them. 
Then the cities of Judah and the residents of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods they have been burning incense to, and they certainly will not save them in their time of disaster. Your gods are indeed as numerous as your cities, Judah, and the altars that you have set up um, to shame, um, altars to burn incense to Baal, a numerous, as numerous as the streets of Jerusalem. As for you, do not pray for these people. This is God speaking to Jeremiah now. He says, as for you, do not pray for these people. Now, you might want to make a little mental, mental note of that and link it to the last chapter in 1 John, where God uh, where it says, uh, through John, he says, um, he says that um, not all sins are unto death. But he says, there is a sin unto death, and I tell you, you should not pray about that. What's he telling Jeremiah? Don't even pray for these people. I know they're your people. I know they're Israelites, but don't pray for them because I'm not going to listen. You can do without what you want. Anyway, um, it says, As for you, do not pray for these people. Do not raise up a cry or a prayer on their behalf, for I, will, uh, for I will not be listening when they cry out to me at the time of their disaster. What right does my beloved, God's still calling them his beloved, but he says, What right does my beloved have to be in my house? having carried out so many evil schemes. Can holy meat prevent your disaster so you can rejoice? The Lord named you a flourishing olive tree, beautiful and well with well-formed fruit. He has set fire to it, and its branches are consumed with a great roaring sound. The Lord of hosts who, planned, who planted you has decreed disaster against you because of the harm of the house of Israel and the house of Judah brought on themselves, provoking me to anger by, um, anger by burning incense to Baal. Now, Jeremiah here decrees, um, as I digresses, to notice the, the attempt on his life plotted by the townspeople of Anathon. Oh, I'm sorry, Anathoth. Uh, he, had to, he had no suspicion of it, actually, by the way, until the Lord revealed it to him, as it is recorded both here and in the following chapter 12 and verse 6 in the book of Jeremiah. It says, The Lord informed me. This is Jeremiah talking about how God informed him about a plot against his life. The Lord informed me, so I knew. Then you helped me see their deeds. For I was like a docile lamb led to the slaughter. I didn't know that they had devised plots against me. Listen, let's, uh, let's destroy the tree with its fruit. Let's cut him off from the land of the living so that his name is no longer remembered. But Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the hearts and the minds, let me see your vengeance, uh, let me see your vengeance on them, for I have presented my case before you. Therefore, hear what the Lord says concerning the people of Anathoth, who want to take, uh, who want to take away your life. They warn, uh, yeah, they warn, you must not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will certainly die at our hand. Therefore, this is what the Lord of hosts says to you. I am about to punish them. The young men will die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters will die by famine. They will have no remnant, for I will bring disaster on the people of Anathoth in the year of their punishment. Now, though all of these disaster, the disaster was prophesied and accomplished, God gave Jeremiah the honor to decree the future hope for Israel in the establishment of a new covenant which we have referenced many times over the years, and we see its fulfillment, actually, in the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse 15. But it's written in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 31 through 34. It says, Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This, is, this one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke even though I had married them. The Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. The Lord's declaration. I will place my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them. The Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. Thank you, God. Whew. Jeremiah describes the 70-year exile that they would undergo, but also of their glorious return in Jeremiah chapter 25, 
part of which we read at the very beginning of tonight. Jeremiah poured out oracles of judgment on the nations in Jeremiah chapter 46 through 52, but he counseled Israel to circumcise their hearts unto God way at the beginning of his prophecies in Jeremiah 4.4 4, to the Lord. He prophe he, um, his prophecies went unheeded, so he went into a forced exile of his own making in Egypt where he uh, uttered some of the concluding prophecies recording in Jeremiah uh, 42 to 44. Again, the time period of Jeremiah's ministry was approximately from 626 to 586 BC, a period of about 40 years. Greater Israel, meaning the other 10 tribes, other than Judah and Benjamin, and Benjamin had been, began their deportation to, uh, to Assyria back in 734 to 724 BC. So in that 10 year period from 734 to 724 BC. Judah's 70 year exile to Babylon began about 120 years later, okay? At approximately 608 BC and lasted till 538 BC, okay? Um, we're gonna be doing a great deal of correlating all of this as we go forward, but next week we will probably have a bit of an overview of the six books to give you just as kind of like a review, you know, um, then we'll have a short break in which we will have uh, topic driven messages, one or two that are from the suggested box. If there's anything there. And then after that, we'll probably have a few weeks of game nights just to solidify what we've known. Okay. Again, we're not trying to get into specific dates and stuff like that. We're, we're trying to make this so that you're getting the meat of the bone. You know, it, sometimes it is important what prophet was living at what time period. You know, I mean, we know that Sam, Samuel was alive during the time of, of Saul and David and stuff like that. You remember Elijah and Elisha, major prophets that we brought up, okay? I'm not going to pull out some obscure stuff, you know, just names that you've heard over and over. Uh, and, and we'll make those kind of things part of the review. So it's not going to, none of it's going to blindside you. But the big deal is that by the end of all this, you'll have a, a good decent overview in your head that, you know, when you read other passages as we go through the rest of the Bible, you're going like, I remember that. I remember that was during that one guy's, uh, you know, you may or may not remember the name, name, the name of the king, but you could probably find it because you have enough to connect with, right? So that's what we're aiming at. Great. Grace. Grace. Grace.